everybody and welcome to St. Stephen's Church Online. My name is Lauren Talbot and I'm an ordinand here at St. Stephen's. I'm delighted you've joined us today and if this is your first time tuning in then an extra special hello. You're so welcome uh, and we've got a great service lined up for you. This week, we're going to be taking a slight pause from the teaching series on Revelation. Uh, and instead, we're going to be hearing an amazing talk that Rachel Bedford, our associate vicar, preached last week in our morning services. The talk's part of a short series entitled Spiritual Health Check. And this one is all about time. I was really challenged and encouraged by this message last week. So get your notepads ready uh, and jot down anything that the Lord might want to highlight for you. As we come now to a time of worship together, can I encourage you to stop anything else that you might be doing and begin to solely focus your mind on God. I'm going to read a verse from scripture to prepare us from Isaiah 25 verse one. I'm gonna read it a couple of times. Uh, and as I do, can I ask you to close your eyes and begin to bring to mind some of the marvelous things that God has done. Oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness, you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. And again, O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness, you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. Lord God, thank you that you are faithful. Thank you for the marvelous things that you have done and continue to do. We come before you now in praise and adoration. Accept our worship as we lift your name high this morning, wherever we are. Come and meet with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. Cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. Cast my mind
why the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed in Jesus' face and all praise the name of the remain in a posture of worship, remembering that we are seeking the same God that we've just sang about, the God who entered into our suffering, died, and then defeated death for our sake. So firstly, we're going to pray for the world, secondly, for the NHS, and finally, for ourselves. Um, and at the end of each section, I'm going to say, Lord, in your mercy, and if you, you could respond at home out loud with me saying, hear our prayer. So let us pray. Living God, deliver us from a world without justice and a future without mercy. In your mercy, establish justice. And in your justice, remember the mercy revealed to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Take a moment at home to bring to mind places around the world that need God's justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now let us pray for our NHS and the health professionals in our nation. God of healing and compassion, we thank you for the establishment of the National Health Service and for the dedication of all who work in it. Give skill, sympathy, and resilience as they care for the sick, and your wisdom to those engaged in medical research. Strengthen all in their vocation through your spirit, that through their work, many will be restored to health and strength through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, we're going to pray for ourselves. Can I encourage you to recall to mind anything that you are currently seeking God's hand in, whether it be in your own life or in the life of somebody that you love? And let's bring those things before the Lord together this morning. I'm going to give you a moment to do that. Psalm 139. Verses 1 and 7 read, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Lord, not only do you know the deepest longings of our soul, you are with us. Lord, we praise you that we can call upon your name, and wherever we are this morning and whatever it is that we've brought to you, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. What a privilege it is to pray together this morning. And if you would like to pray with anybody further than about any of that you've brought up this morning, then please do be in touch. One of the team here would love to pray with you. We're going to move on now to our reading for today, uh, which if you want to turn in your Bibles at home is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 17. For you were once darkness, 
but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, notepads at the ready. Uh, let's head over to last week's talk from Rachel. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Rachel. I'm one of the vicars here and delighted to be um, speaking to you today in this third part of our little New Year's series called Spiritual Health Check. So we spent week one looking at identity. Who are we in God? And then we spent week two looking at purpose. How do we find our purpose? And today I'm going to speak about time. We talk about time all the time, don't we? Think about all these idioms in the English language. Time rich, time poor, all the time in the world. Time flies, time is on my side. In the nick of time, killing time, turn back time, wasting time, I had a whale of a time. <laughs> and there's no end of books about time management or about building habits. I've got several, many of which were at the church office, but a few of which I had lying around at home. Here we go. The Power of Habit, all about how to have good habits to maximize time. Or this one is called At Your Best. This one, 4,000 Weeks Time Management for Mortals. Perhaps these sorts of books are really inspirational to you, or perhaps you find them really quite stressful. Oliver Berkman, in this one, the, the 4,000 Weeks Time Management for Mortals, explains that despite our labor-saving devices, we're plagued by filling inboxes, lists, and the feeling that we should be doing more. He writes, busyness has been rebranded as hustle. Pressure to fit ever-increasing activities into a non-increasing quantity of daily time. Time, our most precious, most finite resource. We can make more money, we can make more space, but we cannot make more time. In recent years, one approach to making the most of our times has been to talk about this thing called life hacks, which I find really fascinating, life hacks, as a kind of play with language. I mean, like, what? I'm guessing the idea is that you sort of take an axe metaphorically to your day and you try to cut out of your day the things that are wasting time. But as Berkman writes in this book, productivity can be a trap. He says, becoming more efficient just makes you more rushed. Trying to clear the decks simply makes them fill up again. Now, I'll let you into a secret. I love a book on time management, and I actually have quite a stash of them at home. <laughs> but the first thing I want to say is this, that all the productivity wisdom out there is nothing compared to the wisdom the Bible has for us about how we use our time. And so the goal of today's talk is to encourage you to apply a spiritual health check to your time, but through the lens of the Bible. How can we let what it says in here shape how we think about our time? I want to give you a little bit of context about the reading first before I just make three simple points. But the context first is this. The New Testament speaks a lot about the doctrine of sanctification. St. Paul writes about sanctification, I'd suggest perhaps more than anything else. 
Sanctification means that as disciples of Jesus, we should be every day becoming more like Jesus. And part of our vision here at St. Stephen's is growing disciples. And a disciple that's growing is a disciple who is becoming more like Jesus. Before all else, our time should be orientated towards that goal. God says to his people throughout the Old Testament, be holy as I am holy. And then Jesus says to the people around him, follow me. He doesn't say, oh, just kind of half-heartedly wander behind me. Jesus says, leave what you're doing and come and follow me. Copy me. Let your life be like mine. We are to be sanctified, to become like Jesus. That is the goal of the Christian life. Here in Ephesians, Paul explains in pictures in chapter 4 what it should look like to be a sanctified follower of Jesus. He speaks about the old life and the new. He says, you've been taught to put away your former way of life, your old way of life, and be renewed in your minds. And he uses the metaphor of clothes, which he comes back to in other parts of the New Testament. He says, clothe yourself with the new self. Be like Jesus. In other words, we are to be different, to be constantly changing and growing. Think about the most Christ-like person you know. Just think about them in your mind now. How did they become like that? Because they took their sanctification seriously. Because they walk with Jesus closely. Because it matters to them that they are becoming like Jesus. They spend time Becoming like Jesus. As you can probably guess, I find sanctification really exciting. (laughs) And having studied the life and teachings of Jesus, I believe he was and is incredible. I don't believe there's anyone who's ever lived who compares. Albert Einstein wrote this of Jesus. He said, I am enthralled by the figure of Jesus. Jesus is too colossal for the pen, Einstein wrote. Jesus is so captivating, we can't find the words to write about him. And let me say this, if you are visiting church today, you're not familiar with the life of Jesus, can I encourage you to find out more? If you haven't read the Bible before, or you haven't read it for a long time, start with Mark's gospel and find out about Jesus. Jesus, how much he loves you and wants to know you. Personally, I don't believe there is a better life goal, a better thing to spend your time on than trying to become more like Jesus. But it's not a very easy process. In fact, at times, trying to become like Jesus is really painful because we bravely hold up a mirror to our lives and we go, oh, gosh. And in prayer, we go, oh, gosh, Jesus, would you change that ugly part of my character? Would you change that selfish bit of my heart to make it a bit more like yours? I mean, it's hard work, sanctification. And yet this is the goal. And this is what Paul is writing about here in Ephesians. And here in chapter 5, he's giving some suggestions about their time management, about how they could use their time well in order to help them become more like Jesus. Three simple points. Firstly, he says, see then that you walk circumspectly. See that you walk circumspectly, he writes. See that in your everyday life, as you literally walk and add those steps on your watch, that you are circumspect. Now, in the original language, it doesn't mean by circumspect kind of suspicious. What it means is be careful, be diligent, be earnest, be accurate. Paul is saying what you do with your time really matters. Be careful with the time you have. 
I wonder how often someone has asked you to do something or be somewhere and you've responded, I don't have time. I say that loads. I say it really quite regularly. But logically speaking, can I be so bold as to say, when we say that, it's complete nonsense. Because every day there is buckets of time, right? Every day the sun will rise and there it is, time. (laughs) Then we do the day, the sun will set, and then the next day the sun will rise, and there it is, time. So maybe a more accurate thing to say when people ask us to do something or to be somewhere is to say, I can't make time for that, or to admit, I I didn't make time for that because I'm, I'm doing something else. It's a bit more honest, perhaps a bit more thoughtful, a bit more circumspect about what we're doing with our time. Regularly, because I have decided to use my time for one thing, it means I have not been able to do something else. And I know that sometimes that has meant that I have disappointed people. And for many years, I carried that disappointment and guilt all the time. But let's remind ourselves of Jesus' approach to his time. I love the story in Mark 1 where, this is right at the beginning of Mark's gospel, we we read that Jesus goes to visit Simon's mother-in-law who is sick. And he arrives there and he heals her. And the news gets out that Jesus has healed this woman. And then it says in the text that loads of people come to the house. They start knocking on the door because they too want to be healed. Then we get the impression that Jesus must have healed a few of them and then stayed overnight. And then in the morning, it says this, it says Jesus got up. In fact, the Greek says Jesus snuck out. He snuck out because there's all these people everywhere. He's tried to sneak out. He left the house and he went off to pray. And the disciples wake up and they don't know where he is. And they're quite annoyed because there's loads of people who have come to get healed. And when they find him later on in the day, the disciples are really grumpy with Jesus. And they say, where have you been? We couldn't find you. But Jesus isn't apologetic in that moment. He responds by saying, let's go somewhere else. Let's go somewhere else. In prayer, because that's what he's been doing, he is discerned. Let's say no to that in order to say yes to this. Jesus has probably disappointed people with the decision that he has made about his time. How comforting is that for the moments when maybe we have to do the same? Time is finite. We cannot logically do everything. We cannot be all things to all people all the time. So we must prayerfully discern how to be circumspect about our time, how to be careful, how to be honest with people about what we can do and what we can't do and won't manage. And then not to carry the guilt about the stuff we can't manage. I feel that some people may be here today who need to hear that. For me to say to you, the Bible gives you permission. In fact, the Bible teaches you to approach your time in that way. Paul writes, see that you walk circumspectly. Just think it through. Be careful with how you spend your time. Secondly, Paul writes here, he says, redeem the time. I love that word, redeem. It means literally to rescue, to purchase. It would have been the word that they used at the time when they went to the marketplace to buy things, to redeem, to buy things from the marketplace. Imagine going to a market with maybe a list of fruit that you want to buy. Chances are you'd probably look, smell, touch, make sure that you got the best fruit. And now imagine that that fruit represents pockets of time. Paul writes, redeem the pockets of time. Choose the best time for the things that you want to do with it. Maybe all of us have pockets of time in our lives that need to be redeemed. 
rescued. And this will look different for everyone. But for example, what about that late night time that we all kind of waste? Whether it's watching that extra episode of TV or scrolling mindlessly through our phones. How about saying, I'm going to rescue that time. I'm going to redeem that time. I'm going to go to bed a bit earlier in order that in the morning I can get up earlier and I can pray. Do you know, I have an alarm on my watch that goes off at 9.30 and it doesn't stop. It just goes, go to bed, go to bed, go to bed, go to bed. <laughs> and more often than not, I get really annoyed with it. And sometimes I ignore it. But in the main, I do what it says. And I go to bed in order that I redeem the time that I would otherwise waste and so that I can get up early to pray. Now, the people in the life group that I used to lead will testify to this because we were leading this life group in our home. And at 9.30, the alarm would go, go to bed, go to bed, go to bed. So we'd had a really lovely evening at life group. But then I'd just say, right, everybody get up. You need to go. And that's not because I don't care about them. I love the people in my life group dearly. But we started at half seven. We've done a couple of hours. I've got to redeem the time because <laughs> I need to get to my bed in order that I can get up to pray. It's not rude. It's just redeeming the time, thinking it through. How can I best use the time I have? And so as we do this spiritual health check, can I encourage you to think about your time? to redeem pockets of it. Even if you were to rescue 10 minutes of your time to redeem it every day. In 10 minutes, what? You could read maybe two chapters of the Bible. That's golden time that you hadn't perhaps thought about. You could rescue it, use it for something else. Thirdly, with regards to time, Paul says in verse 17, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How do we actually do that? How do we actually discover what the will of the Lord is for our time? Well, I want to give you just a little illustration. My, my mum would often phone me and she would go, Hi, Rachel, how are you? And I'd go, Mom, I'm really busy. And she would say, I'm so sorry you're so busy. And then I would say, yeah, I'm really, really busy. And she would say, could you be any less busy? And I was like, no, it's a nightmare. I'm really busy. And, <laughs> and one day I imagined listening to a transcript of that phone conversation. I asked myself the question, like, Rachel, what are you even saying? That's not even a conversation. It's like a non conversation. What's underneath all of that? And this is what I realized. I say I'm busy because I'm feeling a bit stressed. I also say I'm busy because I'm feeling bad maybe that there's one or two things that my mum asked me to do that I haven't done. But at a really deep level, I say I'm busy because it makes me feel that my life is worthwhile and it makes me feel good. So in recent years, after sitting on this for a while, we have banned the phrase, I'm busy, in our house. You're not allowed to say it in our house. Because primarily we've done that because we believe that Jesus would never have said, I'm busy. Jesus did and achieved a lot but he wasn't busy because he needed to make his life feel worthwhile or because he, he needed to make him feel good. You can imagine Jesus picking up the phone and going, I'm so busy. Can you? You can't imagine Jesus doing that. Jesus was so unified with God the Father. He spent so much time in prayer. He would have prayed, God, show me what to do with my time. Show me when I should move on. Show me who I should speak to, but who I shouldn't speak to. Guide me as to how I should spend my time. Paul writes here, understand what the will of God is. Jesus understood God's will for his time because he spent time in prayer, asking God, how should I spend time? my time. Let me finish with this. When I was at university, I heard a sermon 
about prayer. And the preacher told a story about Martin Luther, you know, the father of the Reformation. And the story goes like this, that a friend of Luther said to him, what are you doing tomorrow? And Luther replied, work, 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 from early till late. In fact, I have so much work to do that I'm going to spend the first three hours in prayer. And the preacher told this story and then said something like this, if you're busy, you need to pray more to help you get through the busyness. And as a 21-year-old, I remember thinking, that's just stupid. That's just stupid. Because if you pray for three hours, you've wasted three hours (laughs) that you could be using to do all the other things. At the time, I was doing well in my Christian walk if I was praying for 30 seconds a day, let alone praying for three hours. But you know, over the years, that sermon has nagged at me again and again and again. And if you can imagine a continuum of prayer where I started at 30 seconds and three hours, I'm creeping all the time, closer to three hours, but not because I have more time. In fact, the opposite is true. I have significantly less free time now in my mid-30s with two small children and a husband that works a lot and I often work a lot. I have significantly less time than I did when I was 21 and I was just swanning about as a student having a nice time. But the older I've got, the more I have understood what Luther was saying. That time with God is never lost time. It's never wasted time. It's the very best of times. So I need to spend more time with God the busier I get so that he can guide me as to how I might use my time. And my prayers are becoming all the time more raw and more reliant as I say to God every day, I cannot literally get through the things I need to do today in the time that I have. So Lord, would you show me? And I'm going to sit here for a long time, God. (laughs) And I'm going to wait for you to guide me and show me how to have that conversation which email to prioritize, which meeting to say yes to or no to, which of my children to spend more time with today. I'm going to sit here for a long time, Lord, because I need you to show me how to spend my time. And I have to say, this has been such a source of freedom to me. I've come to believe that it is possible to have a lot of things to do and yet to remain unstressed about time. And I believe it's possible to be filled with incredible faith as to what our time can achieve. So, spiritual health check part three. What are you doing with your time? How might you redeem some of your time? How might you spend time with God, working out his will for your time. Amen. Wow, thanks so much to Rachel for such a challenging but freeing message. I don't know about you, but as a mummy of three young children, balancing the responsibilities of my family and also my training, time is something that too often feels in short supply. Rachel's challenge last week, uh, inspired by Martin Luther to pray more in the busyness, really struck me, uh, specifically around asking God how he wants me to use my time day by day. And it's something that I've already been able to put into practice this week. But what was it for you that has stood out this morning? Maybe a word or a phrase or something else? There's so much to consider from what it is that we've just heard. So as I pray now, wherever you are, allow God's Holy Spirit to continue to speak to you 
as you consider how he might want you to use your time more circumspectly, redeeming it wisely. Lord God, thank you for the message that you have shared with us through Rachel today. Thank you that you invite us into fellowship with you in prayer and worship and through your word. And we ask you that you would lead us and shape us more and more into your likeness as we spend time in your presence. God, we're sorry for when we haven't prioritized you, for when we've continued on in our own strength. Lord, I pray that nothing would draw us away from you, that before the activities and busyness of life overwhelm us, we would remember to spend time with you. Give us wisdom as we discern our response to this message and the strength to put whatever that is into practice. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Let us sing our final song together now. All the saints in
pleasure to gather together this morning wherever you are. I pray that you've been blessed and encouraged by this morning. Before you head off though to the rest of your day, I'd love to pray Philippians 1, 9 to 11 over you. May your love abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>